Hello, this is Modern Rebels. I'm Ben Norton, as always joined by my co-host Max Blumenthal. And today we are talking about the crisis going on in Haiti. On July 7th, the president of Haiti, Jovenel Moïse, was assassinated. And although Jovenel Moïse was really a dictator, he had dissolved the legislature, he was running by dictate, and he was totally backed by the U.S. government, the, the U.S. and the so-called core group, the Western imperialist countries that, that have control over Haiti, they did approve of pretty much everything that he did, Moïse, but he also apparently got in the way of some local oligarchs and there was an internal political conflict and they killed him. And in this episode today, we're going to be talking with two experts on Haiti and we're going to discuss why Moïse was assassinated, who potentially could have done it, what they would have to gain from it, and what the future of Haiti could look like. I mean, this is a country that has been tortured for 200 years by foreign meddling, imperialism, neo-colonialism. It has been tortured. The people of Haiti have been punished for 200 years for leading the first successful slave uprising to overthrow slavery and end French colonialism. And now, of course, there is a kind of U.S. neo-colonialism today. So joining us to talk about this today is Nazaire Sanfort. He is a Haitian journalist and agronomist. And unfortunately, as you'll see in this interview, we were talking to him from Haiti. So the internet in Haiti is often very weak. And especially if you're at an internet cafe where he was for working class people, it's hard to get really strong internet. So unfortunately, you'll see that the signal was very weak. We tried to have video, but it was cutting out. And then even the audio was very weak. So I actually went through and I edited some of the stuff to try to just take what was salvageable at least. So you can listen to the perspective of a Haitian on the ground. Of course, it's really important for us to get Haitians there in the country to share their perspective. But unfortunately for technical reasons, that's very hard to do. So we're also joined by another great guest and Haiti ex expert, Jeb Sprague. Jeb is a friend of the show. He has contributed to the Gray Zone, done some good reporting on U.S. imperialism in Latin America and the Caribbean. And he's also an, ex an, ex an academic expert, a scholar on Haiti, who has written several books, including a book about the U.N. occupation of Haiti. So with these two guests, we're going to talk about the different players involved from Colombian paramilitary groups, including a cousin of the far right Colombian narco leader and political kingpin Alvaro Oribe. His cousin was involved in this assassination, along with top members of the Colombian military, elite special forces units who were trained by the U.S. government. And furthermore, we talk about the different Haitian oligarchs involved, the Haitian U.S. citizens who were detained and allegedly involved. And finally, we talk about the very strange role of this Florida-based, Doral, Florida-based contracting firm led by a right-wing Venezuelan-American, uh, you know, anti-Chavista fanatic who supported the coup of Juan Guaido and hated Hugo Chavez and the president Nicolas Maduro. He has this firm based in Doral, Florida, a suburb of Miami. So there's some very strange parallels to the infamous assassination of JFK which also, of course, had a lot of the anti-Castro Cuban networks and U.S. intelligence links and all this, these shady characters. So it's a very strange story, but without further ado, we're going to cut to our interview now. Thanks for listening. I'll never apologize for the United States of America, ever. I don't care what the facts are. Why are we going to sit down and talk to these quote-unquote moderate rebels? Who are the truly moderate rebels? The search for the moderate rebel do these moderate rebels exist? Moderate rebels. Okay, we are live. Hello, everyone. Today we're doing a live stream talking about the situation in Haiti, the crisis in Haiti, the assassination of President Jovenel Moïse on July 7th, and the, the aftermath. I mean, the details are still not clear, and there's a lot to talk about today. And we have two excellent guests to try to help us understand what's going on. One is joining us from Haiti, and he's Nazaire Saint-Fort. And 
we were, we were having uh, some technical issues. The internet in Haiti is often rather weak, but we do have him here. So hopefully he'll be able to, to communicate with us and, and talk to us about what's going on there. And we're also joined by Jeb Sprague. Jeb is a scholar who has written books about Haiti and, and done a lot of research on Haiti and worked with uh, Nazaire Saint Fort for, for many years. So thanks for joining us guys. I just want to start really generally with what's going on. I mean, it's a pretty incredible situation. There aren't ma that many cases of magnicide in the world, really, where the president is actually assassinated. And there's a lot of discussion over who did it, the power struggle going on right now in Haiti. And there's a lot to, to unpack, but maybe we can just start with an overall overview. What do you think the situation is like? right now. Um, I'll start with you, Nazaire. Can you talk about what the situation is like for you um, as Haitians right now with this interim presidency that was unelected, with the president assassinated? What is the situation? The situation right now, uh, we have the assassination, the president assassinated, and it's a very chaotic situation that we have right now in the country, like uh, a political review where we have actually many presidents, uh, like the uh, president of the Haitian Senate, like Joseph Mabel. And uh, right now, everyone is asking, what is the uh, political advocacy? What is going on? What are we going to do? Because Yeah, it, it looks like we're still having a lot of audio issues. I'm going to see if I can maybe try to figure something out here to get a clear audio signal. Um, Jeb, I'm going to pivot to you here. Jeb, can, can you re react to the situation that we've seen? There's been a lot of debate over who was behind this assassination. Can you talk about who the various potential culprits could have been and the, the factions within the opposition to Jovenel Moïse who may have had a vested interest in removing him from power? Um, so thanks a lot, Max and Ben, for having us on the show. It's, it's a great, great to be on with, with the Gray Zone and Moderate Rebels. Um, uh, if you couldn't hear Nazir, what, what he, or if you could only get bits and pieces of what, what he was saying, um, he's talking about the general level of, uh, fear and not knowing that people in Haiti right now are experiencing. Imagine if uh, a group of foreign mercenaries arrived in the United States or in the Netherlands or Canada or wherever you are and, um, murdered the, the, the sitting head of state. And, um, there's a lot of questions now being asked, you know, who, uh, who did this, who, you know, who was the intellectual authors behind this? Why, you know, why did it happen? Or there's definitely, um, it's, it's a complex story and we're, we're going to go through that. Um, and so, uh, right now in the country, there's a lot of anger because their, their head of state w was killed. And, um, in recent days, some of the uh, people that were involved in this in this murder were captured. The, if you've been watching following the media, you know there's supposedly 28 Colombians that were in in Port-au-Prince for the last few months. At least, at least a number of them were there for a while. Um, they're making claims that they were being paid three thousand dollars a month. That they were hired by this company. Um, I don't have the name of the company right in front of me, but. Uh, private security company in Miami. There's also been claims that there are other companies that were involved in this and in, in hiring these mercenaries in Colombia. So whereas Cuba, right, uh, exports doctors, Colombia exports mercenaries. So there's this huge body of uh, retired military people that go to work in, in, in private military contractors around the world. And so um, what happened then just just in the last few days with, with this killing of Jovenel, um, he lives in a, in a hillside neighborhood um, above, you know, much, much, at a much higher level than Port-au-Prince, which is down at sea level. And because the National Palace was destroyed in the, in the earthquake, the, since then, Haitian presidents have been living in their, their own homes out, out in different neighborhoods, usually or in, in elite neighborhoods. And so um, what happened then is that a group of trucks and these mercenaries came up this, this road to where the president was living. And if you've seen the video, it's been on CNN and all over the place of them declaring that they're, uh, 
this is a DEA raid that they're going to that you know step down. They want the Haitian police to step down or the security guards there. And and then there's videos of them going you know inside the courtyard in front of the house. The machine gun fire was heard. And then it came out that the that the president Jovenel Moise, um, the sitting president in Haiti, received 16 bullet shots to the body, um, broken bones, broken. Uh, arm, leg, I believe, his left eye gouged out. And so um, it, there's a lot of confusion here. There, it's not clear if the eye and the broken bones were because of the being sprayed by machine gun bullets or was he tor tortured before being killed. Um, it's clear that there was explosive charges put on a room where his safe was. They looked through the safe and money or documents or things that some of his ID and his wife's ID, I believe, was found on some of the attackers later. Um, so alongside these Colombian mercenaries, there were also two Haitian uh, young men that were caught up in this. And so the, they uh, have been had claimed that they were translators, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so... Uh, there's other people now. There's a there's a man named Christian Emmanuel Sonon uh, who was living in, in Florida and supposedly um, had flown on a private jet to Haiti with some of these mercenaries and uh, you know claiming to be some sort of intellectual author behind this. And he's even or there's even claims that he was going to try to make himself president. Um, and I think everyone I know uh, involved in analyzing this story, activists, um, different organic intellectuals, people looking at this, believe that Sonon is basically a fall guy, um, possibly a conduit uh, through which these mercenaries could have been hired and paid. Um, but if you read the stories about Sonon, I mean, this was like a, a, a low-level... Uh, crook businessman. Um, he had ripped off an evangelical church that he was involved in. Uh, you know, uh, uh, not the type of guy that could get hundreds of thousands of dollars to put together, you know, to pay every month, hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay for these guys, their upkeep, their equipment, all, all of this stuff. Um, and, you know, they were supposedly in Haiti for three months. So it's pretty clear that there are more powerful sources behind the scene. Um, and then the other, we'll go into all of these different different threads of the story, but another uh, major thread then is that what role did the Haitian uh, security forces, the, the USPGN, the, the Palace Guard, what, what, force, what role did they have in this? Um, possibly Leon, Leon Charles, the chief of police, um, the documentarian and, and journalist Kevin Pina, He's, he's reported that a uh, police source of his inside of the, the PNH, the, the Haitian National Police, um, has told him that uh, when these mercenaries were driving up the road to the palace, that at the bottom of the road they had called, uh, when they checked in with the security there, that the security had called Leon Charles, the head of the police, and that he had given the go-ahead for these men to go up the road. So it's not clear, you know, if there's a lot of uh, information floating out there. It's not clear, you know, what, you know, what really happened. Um, and so we can go into more details on that. Well, the details, uh, first of all, I'm trying to get Nazar on the phone. So I don't know if he's here with us uh, and can hear me, but I'm trying to call Nazar on WhatsApp so we and then I can just uh, we can listen to him through my mic. Um, so hopefully we'll get him on through one way or another. Um, but I think we need to pan out a little bit. We're getting into a lot of details because everyone is wondering who's behind the assassination, but we also have viewers who might not be experts on Haiti or have been following the situation as closely as you were. And I think it's important to provide a little context to the assassination. Of course, this is the millionth violation of Haiti's sovereignty so many Haitians who oppose Jovenel uh, are rejecting his assassination as well because they see it as a violation of sovereignty and Haitians are not deciding. And if they are, it's the morally repugnant elite 
uh, who often reflect foreign interest. So there's that, but you know, there was a there were there was a massive uprising in Haiti, much larger than the uprising or protests that we're seeing in Cuba that are like getting a Twitter push notification piped directly into some chip implanted by social media into my brain every few seconds. And these protests need to be addressed before we can understand the assassination. Many people hated him, uh, but also the Biden administration was allowing him to overstay his term. Uh, Jovenel Moise was ruling as essentially a strongman dictator. Uh, the Supreme Court, numerous members had been removed. Uh, he was basically the only person in charge. And then he's bumped off. And, uh, you know, if you really want to get conspiratorial, so much stuff has been happening in Latin America in the last week or so since CIA director William Burns went on his quote unquote very delicate mission, according to the intelligence director of Colombia. So what, what, what kind of context can we give our audience here uh, beyond getting into the um, granular details of the assassination to help them understand the situation that Haiti's in, the political instability? Uh, Jovenel Moise and prior to him, Michel Martelly, um, who was elected in 2011 after, after, the, after the 2010 earthquake, um, really created this this rightist project um, in Haiti uh, post earthquake and Jovenel and even Martelly before him suffered from this extended crisis of legitimacy, especially in the in the urban centers in Haiti um, where uh, so many people have migrated from the countryside to to the urban centers like Port-au-Prince where I think uh, you know three million plus out of the 11 million population li live in Port-au-Prince. And so why, why, you know, why did they face, why did he face a crisis of legitimacy? Well, um, with Haiti's democratic opening in, in the early, in 1990, 1991, um, and then through the elections um, in, the, in the late 90s and, and in 2000, uh, the, 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 the anti-Duvalieres platform, political project in Haiti, the Lavalas project, they consecutively were receiving 50, 60 percent of uh, in those elections of people were turning out to, to vote in the elections or even more than that. Um, and so the difference now is that under Martelly and under Jovenel Moise, you were having under 20 percent of the, the voting age population turning out to vote. So there's really been a political disenfranchisement of the working class of the uh, uh, of the huge amount of the population that, you know, is employed at, at low levels um, or, you know, eking, eking by. Um, and so, and so that, you know, you, you have these giant protests that took place ag against Jovenel while he was in office. Um, you know, he wasn't investing in, in infrastructure for, for this poor, especially in, in the cities. And uh, he was tied in with, you know, so much of the bourgeoisie. He was basically a conduit for the bourgeoisie and uh, the, the old Makut sectors, the, the Duvalieres, you know, were, you know, they've always been close with, with Martelly especially, but, but also with, with Jovenel. And so these guys rebuilt the military or they were starting to rebuild the military that had been disbanded under, under Aristide, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, the, 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 popularly elected liberation, you know, former liberation theologian in Haiti that, that was overthrown in two U.S. coup d'etats in, in 1991 and in 2004. And um, so just to lay the context, you know, after that latest coup, that, that 2004 coup, uh, the country was basically politically cleansed. Um, it wasn't just Aristide that was overthrown. There were 7,500 uh, uh people holding different political offices in Haiti that were that were thrown out of office with that coup. Uh, the police was completely restructured. I interviewed I interviewed a, a, a head police officer of a police union in, in the early 2000 in the mid 2000s that told me that you know four or five hundred police officers had just been uh, fired from the police uh, after the coup. Uh, uh, I think four or five hundred then were actually inserted into the police from right-wing paramilitary groups uh, by the U.S. and after the coup. So there's this long history of foreign intervention, 
Um, I'm sure a lot of your listeners know about, you know, the history of co colonialism in Haiti and the resistance to, to foreign intervention, U.S. intervention in the country. And so when we, when we think about yeah, these recent events, yeah, let, let, we, let's know that context. Definitely. And, um, you know, we know through WikiLeaks about the role of the Clintons, Hillary Clinton and the Clinton Foundation in bringing in Martelli, Sweet Mickey. He was this, you know, famous singer, um, but he also represented the legacy of the Makut. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, just to really boy drill it down for people who might not be familiar with this term. I mean, this, this they're basically they were basically the shock troops of the Duvalier regime the U.S. backed Duvalier regime. So Aristide kind of sweeps in promising to get rid of the Makut. That's why a, one major reason why people elected him. And then they bring them back under cover after this shock of the earthquake and, you know, UN occupation, which was a disaster. Um, Nazar, uh, 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 what, what do you think the factors behind Jovenel's assassination were so many forces in Haiti hated him. They despised him. Um, but what what were the factors leading up to this crisis? So in spite of a lot of people here on the ground, they did not really appreciate Jovenel's the opposition and uh, a, a big a big French of the population. It was a very unpopular president. But after assassination, everybody say okay. We did not like him. We did not want him as president. As the Monday was supposed to end February 7 this year, we did not want him to be assassinated. So it's kind of a lot of stupefaction uh, after assassination. A lot, a lot of people right now, majority of the population, they are asking for justice and mainly they are asking for uh, to find the very people responsible of this assassination. Okay, well, it seems like we've uh, had some um, audio problems there, but I mean, is, Jeb, do you want to weigh in on the, I mean, where Nazar is kind of, uh, he, he was talking in the end about uh, Claude Joseph. So I think there, there's two main points that he's getting at. Number one is the timing of the assassination and what's playing out right now. And number two is the fight within the right wing in the country that really dominates the country. Um, after, like I mentioned before, after the 2004 coup, uh, Femi Lavalas was brutalized, thrown in jail, exiled, murdered, thrown out of power. Um, and, you know, a lot of people killed, uh, popular movement people. Uh, and the, the movement, a lot of some, some parts of it splintered off. Um, under the government that came after the post, there was this post-coup interim brief uh, military dictatorship that was in office at the U.S. and the United States uh, held into power. After that, there was Preval, which was a former ally of Aristide, but was a sort of a social democratic, um, he was anti duvoyeris but he was very close with the bourgeois. And so he came into power. When the earthquake happened in, in 2010, um, they put Preval's people out of, power, out of power and out of the elections. The OAS, there's a very good article uh, by Mark Weisbrot for CEPR, the Center for Economic Policy Research, where he talks about how in uh, the 2011 elections that the OAS intervened, they pushed Preval's people out of the running. Preval had various deals he, he worked with on with Venezuela. Um, the U.S. didn't like that. Uh, and they the OAS basically uh, made it so only two right-wing candidates could run in that election in 2011. Um, so after that, you had Martelly come in with what was called the Tet Calais, the, the bald, bald head. Uh, he has a fully bald head. Um, and this PHTK party that Nazaire was talking about. Um, this party has really come to dominate Haitian politics. There are op opposition parties that are tied to some of the bourgeois uh, elites in the country, um, you know, there, there's these competing factions in, in Haiti's political scene. Uh, but what Nazaire is talking about is uh, Claude Joseph and another man named Ariel Henri. So Claude Joseph was the prime minister of Jovenel Moïse. Jovenel Moïse was the president. So just 
like a day or two prior to the assassination of Jovenel Moise, Ariel Henri was it was announced that he would be he would become a new the new prime minister. He was he was the incumbent prime minister and that that Jovenel was going to transition away from Claude Joseph to Ariel Henri. And so now after uh, Jovenel has been murdered, brutally murdered, uh, these two men are sort of now vying to become the uh, prime ministers in the country. Now, Claude Joseph, the guy that was in there, you know, prior to the assassination and was actually still officially the prime minister the day of the assassination, uh, he has been recognized by the core group, all, you know, the U.S. and all of these imperialist powers. Um, he's, they've recognized him as he will be the prime minister and the elections will be um, held under him. Um, he's a former GNB, which is this sort of youth opposition, uh, like a real fascistic brown shirt type of group uh, that took part in the coup against Aristide. Um, so he was tied in with them. Um, he has support from sectors of the bourgeoisie, like uh, Charles Henri Baker and uh, Apeid. Um, it's also believed that, you know, maybe Lamont, the former prime minister of Martelly, supports him. So there's these sort of factions that have developed. Uh, Ariel Henri, who was the prime minister incumbent right on the day of the assassination, uh, he and another man named Joseph Lambert, who was the uh, uh, the former head of Haiti's Senate, uh, they've sort of come together. And Joseph Lambert is, you know, declaring himself the interim president. And Ariel Henry is declaring himself the, the interim prime minister. And they've gained support um, from a lot of the Makuts in the country, the former du these Duvalieris, like Joseph Baguette Jr., um, but he has a wide group of support behind him. A lot of the opposition groups, the sort of bourgeois opposition, like the democratic and popular sector, um, what's called the DRIPOD, the DIRPOD, of the, another opposition group led by Yuri La Tortue, um, and even Camille Chalmers, the sort of like uh, fake left, the NGO uh, intellectual left uh, that was against Aristide. They've also joined this coalition. So there's sort of this motley crew of coalition supporting Ariel Henri. And so this is all happening. And to uh, one other important context, when I previously talked about the crisis of legitimacy that Jovenel Moïse, that his government was facing in the streets, it was also facing this in the political scene. One of Jovenel Moïse's uh, big uh, failures is that he failed to hold elections. So the Chamber of Deputies, uh, uh, it has a Haiti has a bicameral legislator le legislation, and so the Chamber of Deputies that I think has like 129 or 130 deputies, those were elections were not held for them. Um, only 10 of Haiti's 30 senators have been seated in recent years, so the country has been on like like walking this tightrope of a complete political meltdown under Jovenel Moïse. Um, that being said, people. Not that he's assassinated. Even you know, people just like normal people, uh, you know, are not happy that mercenaries came in and killed their president. Even if they didn't like their president, they don't want Colombians coming in and and, and, and machine gunning him to death. So uh, that th this is the situation as a, as it plays out right now. Yeah. Well, Jeb, you mentioned a, a really key detail in this, and again, we're we're going to try to get Nazaire Saint Fort back. Uh, you know, like I said, the Internet connection in Haiti, unfortunately, is often very weak. So we're going to work on that. But you, you mentioned these key players. And I just want to kind of spell this out again because it can be confusing to people. In fact, two of them actually have similar names, Joseph Lambert and Claude Joseph. So there's two. There's a first name Joseph and a last name Joseph. But in terms of the people vying for power right now, these are the three main three main players. And here you can see if you're watching that on the left, here is Ariel Henry, and in the middle is Joseph Lambert, and then on the third is Claude Joseph. And right now, Claude Joseph, you mentioned, is the so-called interim president. Some people have called him the kind of one Guaido of, of Haiti. He's recognized by the core group, these imperial powers, as the interim leader. 
and they say that there's going to be an election. They're going to have an election sometime soon. Of course, they said that earlier, and it was the U.S. and the core group, the imperial powers, that actually were the ones who allowed Jovenel Moïse to overstay his term and to actually disband the parliament. He was ruling without any elected officials. He was ruling as a dictator. He disbanded the legislative branch, and that was all with the approval of the U.S. and the core group. But now you have this guy, Claude Joseph. So can you talk more about just who this guy is? Because there are people who have been pointing out that, you know, the comparison of him to Juan Guaido is also appropriate because he's been cultivated for many years by a lot of these NGO networks. He, he was part of the, the student movement in the 2000s against Jean-Bertrand Aristide, the left-wing president. And actually, he was from a group that was funded by the National Endowment for Democracy, the NED, which, as anyone who follows our show knows, that that's a CIA cutout created in the 1980s by the Ronald Reagan administration to do what the CIA had previously done covertly, but to do it overtly. So Claude Joseph is really seen as this kind of U.S. puppet figure. And he immediately, right after the assassination of Moïse, he called for the U.S. military to intervene to send troops into Haiti. And of course, Haitians have a history of resisting and, and they know the horrors of the U.S. military occupation and the U.N. occupation. So, so who is Claude Joseph in, in further detail? And what factions do this, this faction, this fight that's going on right now between him and, and Joseph Lambert, is there one who would be better or do they both represent just different factions of the same kind of corrupt bourgeoisie elite class that has just just plundered the country and done nothing for the masses of people. Yeah, it's tough to say if either would be better or worse. I mean, Claude Joseph, he was he was this prime minister under Jovenel Moïse, and he you know oversaw this attempt to do away with the the anti Duvalierus constitution that you know was was written in in 1983 and um, not holding elections and, um, the, you know, the, the, this, other, this other clique that, you know, is p opposed against him. There are people in there that, I mean, we might say are politically not as bad, but um, there are other people that are <laughs> the worst of the worst, like um, Joseph Baghetti Jr., some of these different Makuts. That was the guy, uh, uh, Jean-Claude Duvalier died at the home of Joseph Baghetti Jr., um, in my book that I wrote on Haiti, uh, Paramilitarism and the Assault on Democracy in Haiti that, uh, with Monthly Review in 2012, um, I, I, I show basically the way that paramilitarism has been like reproduced in the country and how it undermined and attacked the, the Lavalas political project. And, and uh, in a lot of ways that were not reported in the media at the time, like basically a, a contra war against the Lavalas government throughout the early 2000s. And as I found then, this guy, Joseph Baghetti Jr., uh, was one of the main people behind the scene that, that was supporting that, that was kind of the brains behind that operation. Um, and he was so close to Jean-Claude Duvalier. So, um, you know, there's, there's a famous quote from a, a woman, a program officer, actually at the NED, uh, at the National Endowment for Democracy in, in, in Washington, where in the 2000s, this woman named Fabiola Cordova, where she said, and I a quote, Aristide really had 70% of the popular support, and then the 120 other parties had the 30% split in 120 different ways, which is basically impossible to compete with. So this guy um, uh, that you're talking about, Claude Joseph, he was part of one of those tiny 120 different uh, you know, directions that the opposition was going in against Aristide. And so he was part of that youth that that youth movement, similar to Juan Guaido, um, you know, trained, uh, uh, you know, a lot of funding connections, uh, and you know, this long term, these different U.S. operations of democracy promotion, right, that have been so big since since the um, really the late '70s, early early and mid '80s, when there was this shift in U.S. foreign policy um, away from outright support for strongmen and trying to create these sort of uh, like these, these de democracy facades. Um, Haiti was actually one of the very first places in the early 80s where uh, the US uh, mobilized its uh, democracy promotion uh, projects. Um, so 
one uh just one one last thing on on that and uh these these factions these right-wing factions that are fighting uh uh scrambling over power and one other thing that uh Nazir was mentioning that uh I wanted to talk about was he brought up uh, uh Lamoth the uh, the the former prime the first prime minister of Michel, Michel Martelly um Lamont and uh he uh apparently worked with Jovenel Moïse uh, on this deal. Jovenel Moïse recently traveled to Turkey and there's uh, things coming out that Jovenel Moïse, when he was in Turkey, he negotiated a deal to sell the Sojourner Corporation, which is an energy company run by uh, Vorbes, one of the biggest wealthy elites in Haiti. And that he was going to sell this off, and that Lamont had helped to to bring this deal about. And so there's this view that uh, it's it's a theory, but it's a lot. What a lot of people hold is that Marta Lee. See, in Haiti, you can only a president can only hold two terms in office, but they can't be consecutive. So you can be president for four years, and you have to leave office for four years, then you can come back for four years. So the belief is that Marta Lee wants to come back and run again for president. And that uh, him and Lamont have split and become like political enemies, and that Lamont was siding with Jovenel, and that Martelly now ha- ha- has aligned with this separate uh, right wing group that, that that Nazir was talking about. Jeb, uh, there was a. Uh, did, I don't, I'm sure you saw the Democracy Now. Uh, Jerry Springer battle between uh, Daoud Andre and Kim Ives, who uh, we may, we're, 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 I, I guess you could say we're f- friends with both of them. We've had both of them on. Um, well, Aaron Mate had Daoud on um, pushback and we've had Kim Ives on multiple times. And we, you know, I'd done uh, talks at um, AT Liberté's uh, center or publishing house in uh, Brooklyn so uh, definitely not getting in the middle of it, but their arguments seem to be about um, this guy, Jimmy Barbecue, Barbecue Cherizier, who I, I hear a lot of talk about. He is a gang leader in Haiti. Um, and Kim was presenting him as someone who's actually become part of a kind of lumpen proletariat revolution, uh, discussed with the complete um, rapaciousness of the right-wing Haitian leadership and the morally repugnant elite. Um, do you know anything about this character? Do you think that's accurate? And what are the role, what is the role of the street here? Um, and uh, those who are leading the uprising that's been going on for the past year? Um, I, I, I see it as basically, uh, it's a reflection of a, of a couple of different things going on. Um, one thing is that the country has really been flooded with uh, with weaponry, with uh, you know, from the U.S. market, uh, small you know, different small different types of firepower from machine guns, all sorts of weaponry has really flooded into the country. Um, a lot of the sort of like popular collective sort of soul movements that have formed under Lava Loss are really broken apart. Some some still exist, but you know they're sort of pu- pushed under and and repressed, and you know you know uh, it's it's a much more uh, difficult situation now for uh, activists in the country, I think. Um, and so, uh, I mean, Kim Ives, he's he's supposedly spent a few days uh, meeting with this this leader of the of this gang, and I believe in Bel Air. And uh, who's who's working with a number of other gangs, but you know, there's a lot of a lot of good people that I respect that are are um, disagreeing with Kim, and that um, so there's sort of this argument over you know he, he's kind of using this revolutionary rhetoric and you know painting images of Che Guevara and uh, things like that, and um, but he's uh, you know there's a lot of allegations about him being connected to different killings and criminal activities. Um, I mean, it's not a vanguard party that is like leading some sort of uprising, right? It's uh, this sort of collection of these different uh, these different armed street, street groups that uh, you know 
maybe some of them are doing more kind of like cleaning up the streets or fighting certain guys. Others are involved in criminal activities. And it's, it's a variety of these different uh, armed groups. And, uh, you know, the problem is if, if he's killed and Kim will acknowledge this, if he's killed, um, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's a one man show and, uh, you know, he's sort of a charismatic guy, but, uh, it does, it's not clear to me where, you know, how it leads to, to, to something that, you know, any sort of structural change in the country, it's more of a reflection. I, I, I see it as a, just sort of a desperation the, the you know, how, how bad the situation has become in, in the country, um, the political disenfranchisement of, of the, the popular classes in, in the country. Yeah. And this is related to a question I was going to ask you, Jeb here. So a lot of people are saying, you know, qui bono, right? So who benefits from this assassination? We were talking about Claude Joseph and something that is really interesting. And I think is really noteworthy to understand what's happening again, Claude Joseph, who to remind people, is this character who is very much a kind of Juan Guaido figure, a very loyal U.S. government asset. He's been cultivated by Washington and its soft power networks for many years against Aristide. And now he's the interim president, the unelected de facto leader of Haiti, recognized by the U.S. and the core group. Now, he was also under Jovenel Moïse. He was appointed interim prime minister when Jovenel Moïse was president. And that was in April of this year. And he was supposed to be replaced by, you mentioned, Ariel Henry. Uh, the, and, and my understanding is that the day that he was supposed to switch was actually the day that Moïse was killed, when, which is when Ariel Henry was supposed to become the new prime minister under Jovenel Moïse. So just the timing alone makes that, of course, extremely suspicious and very heavily suggests that this guy, Claude Joseph, had a, a very deep, at the very least, he benefited greatly, he had a deep interest in removing Moïse because he was going to be demoted as prime minister and kicked out and replaced by this, this other figure, Ariel Henry. So now that Moïse is dead, not only is he no longer the acting prime minister, but he's also the simultaneous acting president. So that would strongly suggest that everything was in the interest of Claude Joseph. Again, this guy who is a very strong U.S. asset. I mean, Jovenel Moïse was also a U.S. asset. That, that's the funny thing about a lot of these characters mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. in terms of geopolitics, they pretty much all serve the same interests. And it, it seems to be geopolitically, the core group isn't so concerned with what puppet they have in power. It's more of a, an internal conflict among the elites inside Haiti. But do you think it's pretty fair to assume that Claude Joseph and his political allies might be behind the assassination? That, that's one of the questions. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a few key questions. I think the number one is uh, who is behind the assassination? Is it uh, an internal PHT uh, you know, operation or is it um, uh, primarily motivated by people on the outside of PhD DCOP that are, are also, uh, you know, wealthy elites and, you know, you know, work together with the coup against RC in 2004. So people like Yuri Latour too, um, right? Nate, who we know through WikiLeaks is considered one of the most corrupt uh, people in the country. Uh, Bulos, you know, one of the big wealthy elites that owns the Nissan dealership in Haiti. And, you know, so the, a lot of these people have actually been called in by uh, the police to be questioned, Reginald Boulos, uh, Stephen Benoit, Yuri La Tortue, Dimitri and Jean-Marie Vorb. Um, so these are some of the different people that are, are being called in to be questioned. Um, so that's a big question then. Who, who is it with? Is it uh, the opposition or within the PHTK um, or pro possibly some of them together? Um, so there's different scenarios here. The other big question, I think, is how involved was the palace guard, was the uh, security around Moïse? How involved or not involved were they? Um, three, it, so it's claimed that there were only three security guards at Jovenel, directly in Jovenel Moïse's home uh, when it was attacked and that these guys were uh, tied up and 
later released in downtown Port-au-Prince. Um, uh, and so there, so, the, so there's different claims about, about how this played out. Uh, one other interesting thing I would point out, and you guys can have this scoop actually, is that uh, Democracy Now! Uh, this morning, they led with uh, what was uh, allegedly an audio recording of the widow of Jovenel Moïse, uh, Martine Marie, and, uh, and uh, they led with that. Um, but if you talk to any expert or you know, ha ha Haitians that are following this closely, uh, it's widely believed that that was a fake audio clip of her. Um, and they played it in the beginning of Democracy Now! Like it was a real audio clip. Um, so she that was, she, that was posted on her that, Twitter account, but it's oh, but there's okay, no yeah. video. No, well, well, there's no video of it. It's just a picture of her with this audio, and yeah. the voice is really weird in it. If you listen to it, it's a it's a very strange sounding voice. So this this is like you said, many Haitians suspect that it was completely fake. Yeah, and so she was uh, airlifted by the U.S. to Miami, and had, had, I think a number of bullet wounds, but but is alive. Um, early on, there were rumors that. Uh, she was dead, and I, I, I thought she was dead because it was there were a number of people that that were saying that, um, but then we found out that that you know that was also just a rumor. In Haiti, there's something called tele doll, like the people's telephone, where this information spreads, and uh, so it, it, you know that was one reason I didn't want to write an article on this topic because uh, every day there's like new information coming out, and you know once you write something, it, it's set in stone, and so we need a little time to kind of understand. What, you know what's going on and um, um, well yeah so this this brings us to something we talked about earlier now that we've kind of had the overview of the politics and the different factions I think we should talk about the media narratives that are being constructed you mentioned earlier in this broadcast you know the New York Times today at July 12th they had this big cover story claiming that according to Haitian officials and again when I say we say Haitian officials those are the people in the government right now run by this U.S. asset, Claude Joseph, who is part of the anti-Aristide movement, who had a vested interest in removing Jovenel Moïse from power so he could become president. According to this New York Times story, based on what his officials are saying, they're blaming this doctor in Florida, uh, Christian Manuel Sanon. And so Sanon, from what I've talked to from Haitians, like almost no one knows who this guy is. He's completely unknown. And from what, what I've talked to from friends in Haiti and, and other experts like you and others, it's widely suspected that he's the fall guy, right? Like, it's very unlikely this guy actually was behind the assassination, but he's like the, you know, the the guy that they're just going to pin it all on and they're going to try to move on. So so what's your take on and this whole thing? There's different, again, there's different takes on this. So I think uh, a popular um, poster uh, activist on Twitter, Madame Buchmann, who probably a lot of your listeners follow, um, I mean, she basically believes that, it, I mean, if I'm not mischaracterizing her, that it was, you know, an internal PHTK and uh, uh, police, you know, uh, palace guard, that, you know, the police that they that they carried this out and that these people like Sanon, this is all just kind of like a, basically a ruse to confuse people. Um, uh, an, an, another, you know, another possibility in the, looking about is that, um, you know, if, so, so when I, when I published my book in 2012 and I was spent years sort of like interviewing these different paramilitaries and their backers and political and economic backers and uh, military and politicians in the Dominican Republic that at that time played a big role in kind of like, giving safe haven and helping some of these neo Duvaliers paramilitaries and ex-military people. Uh, when I was doing that research, I sort of slowly came to the realization that almost all of the leaders of the major political opposition, they all at one time or another were talking to the paramilitaries or connecting or supporting them in one way or another, but that they were really careful in, in hiding it. And, um, I think there's a good chance that, you know, you have a number of elites that finance this, this coup, people like, like, like Bulos, um, uh, someone like, someone like uh, Vorb, who, you know, whose energy fact company, or the, the energy company that, that he had a contract to run, supposedly being sold off. 
So there's a lot, uh, uh, there's a lot of political elites that would have been very upset about not having to not being able to be in office or having their team in office, you know, with no elections. So we had a lot of in- enemies that could have helped finance this, 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 uh, this operation. And one theory that I've kind of been playing around with is that uh, Sanon is basically, he's sort of like a front guy, fall guy conduit through which um, these mercenaries could have been paid because we know they were traveling with him on a private jet. Uh, and that he, he was sort of this con businessman that, you know, had these illusions of grandeur and, you know, being come being big in the political scene and, and, and these things, but he, you know, he's basically a nobody. And so he could have been kind of like used as a, as a conduit fall guy dupe, uh, to, to get this off the ground. And, you know, there, there, there's some, uh, interviews now coming out from different media sources where they're talking to these alleged uh, transla- the two Haitian translate quote unquote translators and the 26 Colombian or 20, you know, the, I think the majority of the 28 Colombians that they've captured. Um, the, those two, the two Haitians who were the translators allegedly who were working for this, this firm, I just want to stress were U S citizens. Yeah. James Solages and Joseph Vincent. Vincent yeah. Uh, and they were uh, detained as suspects in the assassination. They were the yeah, two U.S. Were, citizens. Yeah, they they were there, and um, but they, you know, they're off and on in Haiti. And that one guy has a has like a charity in Jacques Mel, and uh, you know, had worked various jobs in Haiti. I think he worked as a security, like a reserve security guard in Canada at some point. And so, um, you know, one theory that I've sort of been playing around with is that what they could have done is they could have told these guys, the vast majority of them that they were going in to arrest Jovenel Moise, right? Because he's so hated by so many people. And uh, supposedly Sanon, this uh, corrupt businessman that had ripped off the, some evangelical church, uh, supposedly this guy is saying that he was going to be appointed president and that the mercenaries, they were going to arrest Jovenel, bring him downtown, and he was going to become appointed president. And he lives in Miami. He flew into the U.S. and he was going to become appointed president. So it's sort of like a crazy idea. Um, But there's videos of this guy from 2011 basically saying that he's going to become like a leader of Haiti. So he sort of seems like a crazy guy that, you know, they was maybe used – by more powerful, wealthy interests. And then what I'm thinking is even with these Colombians, uh, the vast majority of them, you know, might've just thought that they were going to arrest Jovenel. They might, you know, they might not even know he was the president. They were just going to go, they, they don't speak French or Creole or, you know, they're, they don't know the history of the context. So they were going to arrest this guy. Maybe they knew it was Jovenel. Um, but, uh, all you would need is a few people to go into the actual room and blow up the safe and, and execute Jovenel. And as we know now, there's like half a dozen of these Colombians that have escaped that haven't been caught by the Haitian police. The other guys were just kind of like laying around in a house and on the street, you know, down the road from where the assassination took place. Um, Yeah. So it doesn't make any sense. They had no plan. Uh, So there's different scenarios than what, what, what here could have happened. Yeah, and so this gets us to the, to the role, the alleged role of Colombian militaries. This article I have up on the screen has gone uh, gone around a lot. It's from the Miami Herald, which you know it, it's uh, you know it's a major newspaper in Miami. Everyone, its its political line is very much against Cuba, against Venezuela, but they have some good reporting sometimes. And this is a very interesting piece that's gone around a lot. And I mean, it's pretty much true. You can you can independently verify that what most of most of what it says is true. The question is why the Colombian paramilitary forces were hired. But this piece discusses how these Colombians who were detained in Haiti. And again, every time the Haitian, the so-called Haitian authorities says something, they say something in this case, we should be skeptical because of course, they're the ones speaking on behalf of the current interim leader, Claude Joseph, this kind of one Guayil style figure. But at the same time, it is true. I mean, they did detain all these Colombians and there's video of them speaking Spanish in Haiti right outside of 
Giovanni Moise's house. So it's very clear. I mean, it is a fact that Colombians were in some way involved. Now, the question is, why were they hired? And maybe you have some thoughts on this. This piece discusses how the firm that hired these Colombian paramilitary forces is called CTU Security, and it's based in Doral, Florida. Now, that's interesting because Doral, Florida has become like a main hub for the extreme right wing Venezuelan opposition. You know, Miami, for people who don't know, they it's been it's been the hub for the Cuban right wing anti Castro opposition, which is actually pretty appropriate because this guy we were talking about, this Florida based doctor, Christian Manuel Sanon, Sanon, who is probably the hitman, he's being referred to as like the Haitian equivalent of Lee Harvey Oswald and the assassination of JFK. And now, so, you know, Lee Harvey Oswald was, was the fall guy blamed falsely for the JFK assassination. And similarly, it seems like Sanon is being blamed for the Moise assassination. And likely it's very, it's clear that there were Cubans involved, right-wing Cubans who were anti-Castro were involved in the JFK assassination. And we potentially have these right-wing Venezuelans involved in the Moise assassination. But the thing is, it's not known if this firm based in Florida, CTU Security, run by a right-wing Venezuelan anti-Chavista named Antonio Entriago, or Antonio Entriago, it's not known if he was, one, if he was brought, he brought on these paramilitaries to assassinate Moise, or on the contrary, they were brought on to be Moise's security. And this is like a big discussion or that Moise just brought them in to serve as his like pawns, his political assets. You were talking about how different political players in Haiti use paramilitary groups to serve their political and economic interests. So there are some people suggesting that actually these Colombians were hired by Moise himself and others suggesting that actually the Colombian paramilitary forces were hired to carry out the assassination. So what's interesting is there's this photo here of this guy, Antonio Entriago, He's this right-wing Venezuelan who lives in Florida. And here is his image on Facebook, no more dictatorship. He also supported Juan Guaido. He's a hardcore right-winger. So, I mean, there's so many weird connections and we can go pretty deep. So anyway, what, what is your take on this debate on whether or not the Colombian paramilitary forces were hired by Moise and that it, they, were, they weren't the ones who were actually behind the assassination, but they were the ones being blamed for the assassination and it was actually his own Haitian security? Or do you think that the Colombian paramilitary's forces were hired to assassinate him? I mean, do you, th do you think that the, the distinction is even that important politically at the end of the day? Um, that's, a, that's a lot of questions, but I think, first of all, I haven't seen any evidence to show that Jovenel hired them. Um, uh, I think they were staying at... Uh, a home that was rented to them by like a political ally, a business elite. But I mean, tons of business elites are as political allies. Um, she was also, I think, tied well, up. Well, really quickly, I should just mention uh -huh. another detail about that is that the, the Colombian media, especially Colombian media outlets like El Tiempo, which are very close to the right wing and to Uribe, mm -hmm. and even Alvaro Uribe, who is like the main right wing gangster who is the most powerful figure in Colombia, he is the kind of kingmaker behind all yeah. of the politics and behind the current president, um, Duque. Actually, his cousin is allegedly involved among these these Colombian paramilitaries. There was a an Uribe who was involved with the Colombian paramilitaries, who's allegedly a cousin or an extended relative of Alvaro Uribe. And their media apparatus in Colombia, they're the ones trying to say that actually, no, the paramilitary groups, they were hired by Moise they were not hired to assassinate Moise. So it's in their vested political interest to claim that the Colombian paramilitaries were actually legitimately operating in the country at, on, at behest of the president. But you're saying that there's not really any evidence of that other than what the Colombian right wing is trying to say and their media apparatus yeah. is trying to say. Yeah, I've seen some Colombian right wing groups uh, or individuals tweeting out that you know the Colombians were trying to protect Moise and all this stuff. Um, you know, I, I just don't buy it. Uh, there, there's a, you know, if you know much about uh, police forces in the Caribbean or in Haiti or in Colombia itself, um, 
the DEA, the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency, um, you know, pays the uh, parts of the the paychecks for a, a lot of a lot of police. Um, they're heavily involved throughout the region, um, and Haitian police have very low salaries. Um, so, you know, and there's a long history of uh, you know the DEA and different U.S. agencies, you know, CIA people mulling into them and all sorts of things. So. Uh, in Haiti, the the Coast Guard is probably one of the most controlled agencies in the in the country, or most heavily influenced by the U.S. Almost completely funded by the U.S., uh, or maybe possibly completely funded by the U.S. So there's a lot of of, of this going on in the country of, of, of U.S. influence. Um, the way I look at it is that uh, the tech uh, as a tech op as a, a technically as an operation. The idea of going in there with, you know, two dozen, uh, you know, light-skinned guys, Colum- Colombians, uh, all yelling DEA with heavy arms and equipment would scare the, you know what, out of out of a, a handful of Haitian security that, that were standing around there. Um, and that and that's the claim is that they they laid down their weapons and uh, that the, that that they were able to to barge in. Now, um, there's two things there. One, you know, everyone is hate, in Haiti is asking why the hell were – there's not a single police officer that was killed. They were not protect. you know, there was only three guys protecting the house. This sounds like, you know, very, very, very uh, sketchy. And so could there have been people on the inside that maybe uh, lowered the number of people to protect him that uh, – you know, providing inside information to different bourgeoisie that could give that to Sanon and his guys. Um, who knows? Um, but I think you're dealing with a huge cesspool in Miami of just so, I mean, for people that, you know, spent time there or talked to people, I mean, it's like, a, that's where the, you know, so much of the, you know, the right wing diaspora exists and, you know, it's there that's like people elites from the well, Caribbean go there to shop on the weekends. That's like a lot just, of mercenaries come out of, you know, companies come out of there on that point. I mean, there was a golf course in Doral, this, this, this Venezuelan bastion in Miami that Ben mentioned where the Bay of piglets, uh, the mercenary invasion of Venezuela, which failed miserably led, uh, by a U.S. mercenary firm was planned. It was planned in Doral. Like, near where ostensibly this mercenary operation was at least contracted. And, uh, you know, for those who don't know Jeb's work, I mean, Jeb went, uh, one of the, I think, I think it was your first piece for us. You went to, uh, a, a, a security firm called air 21, or I guess it was a 21 air, 21, 21 air. air. Yeah. You just burst up in their office with a phone in your pocket, in your front pocket, because they were uh, running guns to Venezuela uh, right when the Juan Guaido uh, coup attempt was beginning. The Venezuelan military or intelligence services had in- intercepted all those guns you see there. And you went down to this firm and just busted up in their office. They weren't too happy and they dispatched you. But, you know, what we're seeing is the privatization. I mean, everything's being privatized in the U S down to these regime change operations. And like, we always talk about NGOs, the NGO industrial complex, it's really IGOs in informal government organizations. Then you have all these cutouts that we've written about. DynCorp is going to basically be holding it down in Afghanistan. Uh, Kimonix, they do so many operations from Ecuador to Syria, as we've written about, and then you have these 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 mercenary firms, and it's just an absolute free for all. Um, the and, and it provides kind of a ventilation mechanism for all of these right wing exile groups that are being held in Florida. That's something the U.S. government has traditionally done since the 1960s. After the Bay of Pigs, you had basically, you know, right wing criminal class mercenary types sitting around in Miami with nothing to do you got to give them something to do. So they would either give them these little foundations and stuff. And that's how they started brothers in arms and started terrorizing Cuba. And they'd give them little operations to do. So they wouldn't do it at home because you want to avoid blowback, you know, the kind of blowback that happened when 
the U.S. was sponsoring Mujahideen in Afghanistan, we got Al Qaeda. So I'll, I'll, I, I see all of this as just a product of, you know, the too many, too many different forces in South Florida. Uh, they have intersecting interests, obviously, and while the U.S. can't control them all, they all seem to uh, advance U.S. interests in one direction. Um, and it's funny because Moise was clearly becoming a PR problem for the U.S. So it's not like they're they're unhappy about this. Can I just add one, just very briefly, to the uh, what you were calling the the Bay of Piglets um, for your viewers? If uh, interesting, if you if you want to do some reading, uh, another incident in in 1981 that in the in the Caribbean was called the Bayou of Pigs. Um, there was actually an attempt by a group of neo-Nazis, Ku Klux Klan members, white supremacists um, from the US and Canada who were uh, working along with some, I believe some uh, uh, military guys from apartheid South Africa that actually went on boats and uh, tried to carry out a coup on the small island of Dominica in the Caribbean. So um, that's a whole nother history if you want to go back and read. but. Uh, this sort of thing, I think, yeah, like you're right, Max. It's intensified yeah, I think the, in recent years. The yeah. head of Gun Owners of America today, Larry Pratt, uh, mm -hmm. I think, was involved in that operation, and also some people who were starting some of the for, first uh, civilian border militias were involved in that as well. It's some pretty fascinating history. Yeah, well, I want to point out really quickly this tweet you mentioned, um, Madame Bukman, one of the best sources on Haiti. I would recommend anyone on Twitter to follow her. She just tweeted out this video, which shows the former U.S. ambassador to Haiti, Pamela White, and she revealed that there was a plan to put aside Jovenel Moïse and put in an interim prime minister. And that was, of course, to avoid the popular demand. There were all these protests of a Haitian-led democratic transition. You earlier, Jeb, you mentioned the fear that if there actually is a free and fair election, that the left-wing forces around Aristide and Lavalas might actually win the election. So there's there's always this attempt to try to manage Haiti by the US and the core group, these imperial powers. So, I mean, the fact that they were discussing that, and then Max just mentioned, the fact that the, the Biden administration and the Blinken White House, uh, the Blinken State Department, uh, maybe a Freudian slip there, because I think Blinken actually is in some ways as powerful as Biden, but the, the Blinken State Department is really trying to do this marketing to portray itself as supporting democracy and human rights. And Jovenel Moïse, they of course supported him and supported him dissolving the parliament and supported him with these dictatorial policies, but it was kind of bad marketing. So now, I mean, like we were said, we we're talking about Q Bono earlier. I mean, the reality is that the US, its interests are served regardless of which of these pu puppets is in power, but now they can at least claim that there is more democratic legitimacy, at least if they have some kind of uh, some kind of election that comes in. I, I just want to also really mention in passing here before coming back to you, Jeb, this other thing that I mentioned, I think it's really important about the links to the Colombian far right. And this is a tweet from um, Madeleine Garcia, who is from Telesur, about this, this shows a video a Telesur published of the Colombian mercenaries that were detained in Haiti. And among them is someone who was a main, is a, she's saying that is a cousin of the main advi security advisor to Colombian president Ivan Duque, who was also vice minister of defense under Uribe. And she, specifically, specifically, she's mentioning something that was also discussed in a pretty good piece by friend of the show, Dan Cohen. He did a good article over at Mint Press News, suspected assassins of Haitian President Moise trained by U.S. linked to pro-cool coup, pro -cool oligarchy. So these are the forces that supported the U.S.-backed coups against Aristide. And Dan Cohen talks about how among these, para, these Colombian paramilitary forces who were detained in Haiti is this figure, Manuel Antonio Grosso Guarín. And he was trained by the U.S. military he was in fact one of the top figures in the Colombian <clears throat> special forces. And his specialty was so-called urban anti-terror operations, again, trained by the US military. And another person who was detained among these Colombian paramilitary forces, as Dan Cohen explains here, is Francisco Uribe Ochoa. Francisco Uribe is the cousin 
of Alvaro Uribe, who was an advisor and again, who worked in the Uribe administration before Juan Manuel Santos and before the current president, um, Ivan Duque in Colombia. So, I mean, we still don't know what these paramilitaries were doing, but these are not like nobodies. The attempt to say that, like, like you said, I mean, there were a few Colombian paramilitary guys who were basically nobodies. And it seems like the two Haitian Americans who are U.S. citizens, they're pretty much nobodies as well. I mean, like you said, one of them, he said that he did work with the Canadian embassy for security, but he was just a security guy. He doesn't seem to be like a, a prominent figure. But you have a major figure in the Colombian military until 2019, that guy Grosso, who he were, he we don't know exactly why he left the Colombian military in 2019, but he was a major figure, one of the most elite members of the of the special forces. And you have a cousin of the most powerful figure in Colombia. The involvement of them just, I mean, that raises some eyebrows. So I, don't, I mean, I don't know, there's a lot to respond to there, but I just wanted to mention that before we conclude the stream here. Yeah, I think um, the Colombian connection is very important, and I think they play a leading role in uh, mercenary hiring out. I know num I know a number of people just from being involved in the region, different people that are connected with people that, you know, the, you know, direct connections with people that are going and, do and doing this, you know. I know somebody that a Colombian friend that had a friend that was working in Yemen, you know, so it's there's – they're all there. It, it's a it's a major industry that's come about. Um, but in regards in regards uh, to the U.S., I think that's the last really key question. Then that we haven't covered is what did the U.S. know um, about this whole thing with all their agents in the country, their antennas, their intelligence uh, information? Did they just allow this to play out? Um, the U.S. has a has a, has a big role in in Haiti. Um, it's you know. It's something like 10% of, of U.S. rice is sold to the country. There's a huge amount of remittances that go into Haiti, uh, $2 billion, over $2 billion a year. So there's a lot of money made off that. That Haiti is very mineral wealth. There's a lot of mineral wealth, untapped mineral wealth, like uranium, gold, and silver for future mining operations. And as we know across the region, um, during this, you know, this global capitalism phase that we see, you know, through our lifetime, uh, where the region is becoming more integrated with, with transnational companies, with labor power being integrated into these uh, different chains. Um, uh, we, we see groups like the World Bank and the IMF playing a bigger role across the region and in Haiti, um, and really trying to create Haiti into a, more of a stable platform for capitalist investors. They ha they've had a tough time because so much of the population is unemployed. And so they're constantly facing this crisis. Um, but the World Bank, the IMF, these supranational agencies, they have a huge role. Uh, right now in Jamaica, officials are required to report daily to IMF staff that reside in the country. In Barbados, an IMF representative sits within the country's central bank um, You know that they have to constantly negotiate with. Um, maybe we can talk about it some other time, but in... Uh, in 2019, I published a book called Globalizing the Caribbean, uh, Political Economy, Social Change, and the Transnational Capitalist Class that looks at the political economic shift, the role of the U.S. power in the region, and uh, elite forces like that, that we've been talking about. All right. Well, we are going to take a pause here. And for those who are listening, we're going to do a part two of this podcast, and it's going to be focused on Cuba. There have been a series of protests going on, very small protests, including some leaders who are funded by the U.S. government, allegedly through soft power arms like the National Endowment for Democracy and the National Democratic Institute. And although the protests are very small, they've been getting an insane amount of coverage in the international corporate media. It's very clear that some kind of shady U.S. government backed kind of color revolution attempt is going on involving like a former porn star. It's a very strange operation and we're just going to address it in brief. And then in the future, we're going to do another entire stream, an entire episode about Cuba. So definitely check that out in part two. You are listening to our discussion with the Haitian journalist Nazaire Sanfort 
Unfortunately, because of technical issues, we weren't able to speak with him much. It was very difficult. The internet in, in Haiti is very weak. And we were also speaking with Jeb Sprague. Jeb is a contributor to the Gray Zone, a friend of the show, and a scholar. And you can follow him at Jeb Sprague on Twitter. If you want to support this show, you can go to patreon.com slash moderate rebels. And as always, thanks so much for listening to the show. We'll see you next time.